Greetings everybody, it's Jim and today I get to talk to you about the psychology of dice. Now whether you're playing a role-playing game or a board game, uh, the way we use dice and the types that we roll affect the game in very subtle ways that we don't even realize. And there's a lot of different angles to this, so let's just get right into the first one. Uh, the first one being reading people based on the dice they bring to the table. Now obviously this is about role playing games on this one uh, because board games generally have their own dice provided, right? And with role playing games it's special because people use their own hard earned money to say something about them. This dice set said something about them and they grabbed it, okay? As much as there's escapism with fantasy, there is also still a link to them uh, whims if I was doing that there's still a link there somehow so this this is more of a personal choice than the fantasy choice of playing a different character something different right this is actually saying more about them and I get this from my days playing poker I used to play low limit uh, Texas Hold'em not no limit Texas Hold'em but low limit Texas Hold'em and even though that's a much more mathematical game and there's not a lot of bluffing and reading people um, I still learned a little bit about it and there was a poker legend called Mike Caro um, which would say things like you know if somebody has their chips all stacked up and very very neatly they tend to be more conservative and if they have them splashed around with dollar bills all over the place they would tend to be more flamboyant and bluff a lot more and do crazy bets here and there um and of course it's poker some people are putting on airs to try to fool you but for the most part especially at the lower levels uh you didn't have to worry about it but i still learned those things so let's take a look at a few of these dice sets and uh see what we can what we can glean um so this set right here uh, when you see this, you probably are thinking to yourself, you know, this is a basic set of dice, right? This comes out of the basic box set, you know, so what can you say about that? Well, this person might be a beginner, um, so you might have to wear the kid gloves if you're the game master. And if you're a player, prepare to help them along because we always want to encourage more people to play and not get discouraged, right? Um, at the same time, watch how much wear and tear is on those dice because if you got a set of dice like that and then you got wear and tear, that's a veteran right there. That's somebody that's played for years since the 80s or something, you know. Um, so that's how that's what I would think. Um, then you got glitter dice or anything flamboyant, you know, wild designs. I'm not talking about marbleized uh, dice or anything like that. But generally, these are the people that want to be more artistic. They want chances to do wild things. They don't want to do the basic, I walk forward and I hit it with my sword as an answer. They want to do, even if they're a fighter, you know, you would expect these people to be wizards, but even if they're a straight up forward fighter, they're the ones that are going to think of doing all kinds of crazy kung fu action moves all of a sudden and make the combat interesting. Give them the opportunity to do so. Then you got the, the opposite. You got these guys. These are your architects and engineers. These are the guys that probably know what a Tog Hauer, if I said that correctly, Tog Hauer watch is. Those $800 plus watches that are based on engineering precision. Uh, these guys are going to know the rules, so you better. Um, and I'm not saying they're going to be rules lawyers, uh, but you might have to watch out for that. But you might be able to ask them for help if you're stuck on something. They'll probably be your go-to guys. And then you got these jokers. <laughs> You got a guy like this, you're going to expect some chaos. You are going to expect your party to be surrounded by orcs and you should be running away or trying to talk yourself out of the situation. And this is where he takes the, this guy takes a rock and he flings it at the nose of the big orc, you know, and starts a war. Um, that's where you're going to have to worry about with this guy. But maybe that's what you want. You're going to have to give the players what they want sometimes. And this is what this guy came to do. Now, another part of the psychology of dice comes down to how they are rolled or how many are rolled. I tend to think that if you're rolling three dice or less, you're doing so for the utility of it. You're doing it to find out a mathematical equation, the most efficient way possible. However, if you're rolling four dice or more, now you're getting into the more of the feely type thing. You're trying to make an effect that the players feel, whether you're a game master or your game designer. The best example I can think of is the 8d6 fireball in Dungeons and Dragons. Now this is of course the spell that everybody makes fun of wizards for because they're just dying to be able to cast this because it just does such monumental damage. But there's another psychological tag to that. Okay, They could very well have just said roll 4d12 or even 2d20. Now I know the mathematicians out there are saying the bell curve is different at the extreme ends but for the most part, you get what I'm saying. Mathematically, they could probably say the same thing and just drill it down. However, 
There is something special about taking 8d6 in your hands when you haven't been able to roll hardly any dice like that at all and then go shake a shake a shake a no whammies, right? <laughs> Wham! Damage. So that's a big psychological thing. So whether you're doing a fireball or you're throwing a whole bunch of arrows at somebody, pelting you or a machine gun, you know, having a lot of dice rolling is a psychological factor. And also the type of dice you're rolling. Maybe you're rolling a um, like a D12 uh, as far as like a laser shot or something like that. Something that, or, or a broadsword that's coming down. It just signifies big damage. And if, of course, you don't want the variance in there, instead of saying 1D20, you could say a, a D12 plus 8. So you have some, some uh, guaranteed damage there. And speaking of D12s, this D12 you're t that I'm showing you here is this one. Uh, Steve Jackson Games actually came out with this one. And I really highly suggest it. I was skeptical about it because they're, they're not the cheapest ones in the world. I think a pair is like six bucks, if I recall correctly. And I bought two pair. Um, but these are very clear. Uh, when you lay, lay them down, you could see what the result is right away. And the fact that you see those dots on there, this is actually a D12 slash D3 die. So there's, a, there's one to three dots on the top. So if you want to roll a D3, you got a chance to do so. It's pretty, pretty cool. I don't know what I'd ever use a D3 for, but you know what? It's there if you need it. So I highly suggest that die. Now, role-playing games don't have a monopoly on the psychology of dice. Board games have them, too. One of the best examples I could think of is Descent Journeys in the Dark by Fantasy Flight Games. Now, I have everything for this system. It's a great dungeon delve. It reminds me of playing Hero Quest as a kid with my brother, little brothers. And that's why I have this. As much as I would take probably anybody else to play uh, the fantasy trip from Steve Jackson game role-playing wise, I would play this with my little brothers in a heartbeat because this is just what it was. Anyway, I'm, I'm talking about the dice here. Now the dice um, basically it does two things. One, it's one roll resolution. You can see that there's multiple symbols on these dice on some of them. Some of them just have one type of symbol, but a lot of them have two or even three. Okay, that's because it's one roll resolution. You're rolling for range. You're seeing if there is any magic or skills that are going to be happening, and you get to see damage all in one roll. Okay, and does two things. One, it makes the game more efficient. You know, you're just rolling once and, you know, you don't have to worry about anything else. But two, and this is the psychology of dice here, it makes it so people with analysis paralysis have nothing to think about. Okay, analysis paralysis generally happens in a lot of games because they're trying to figure out something in their head. They're trying to mathematically figure it out a lot of times, especially in war games and such, um, because they know the percentages of all the dice, and if they get a plus one here or a minus one there, they know they're going to have this percentage to do this and this, and it just cascades, and that's why it takes them so long to to make their move because they're actually trying to figure it out. With these kind of dice, that makes it practically impossible or at least a lot, lot tougher. I mean, I can't say it's impossible to figure this out, but for the most part, you got to go with your gut. You're rolling these dice, you know, you're saying, okay, I'm pretty good here, but you're rolling these dice and you're saying, ah, I'm not so good here. Um, it just makes it so there's too much to think about at once. You go with your gut and people with analysis paralysis, you don't have to worry about too much. So that's the idea of uh, the psychology of dice. Hope you enjoyed this video. Like and subscribe and even comment below. Uh, and I'll talk to you next video.